And the early voting numbers in Nevada look horrible for Democrats. Yeah. In Florida, they look horrible for Democrats if you just compare them to 18 and 20. And I gotta say, also in Florida, I'm hearing so many complaints that the Democratic Party, the state Democratic Party, just isn't there. There's no get out of the so so things are spotty at best right now. You you're you're going around to New York. Yeah. I've got to say every day, the New York Post Every day, I mean, there's 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 uh, horrible horrible uh, crime stories every day on the front page of the New York Post, and uh, people are talking about it. So I was spent the day yesterday with Kathy Hochul, the governor of New York. Mm -hmm. So this is a state that Joe Biden won by 23 points. This is a state where Governor Andrew Cuomo won re-election four years ago with Kathy Hochul on the ticket by 30 points, mm -hmm. and she is in like a real fight, like maybe she's five points up, maybe she's tied, they're not quite sure. And this is New York, and this is an election-denying Republican, Lee Zeldin, election-denying, very pro-life, cheered the day that Hobbs was, uh, that Dobbs, the Dobbs decision came out. And it's like a real race. And so I think there is no Democrat right now that feels safe. You just, you just don't know what's going on. And I was in, I was with Alyssa Slotkin in Michigan mm -hmm. on um, Tuesday night when she did that event with Liz Cheney. And, you know, what I, you know, it's what occurred to me in comparing what I saw in Michigan versus New York is I feel like right. these these red state Democrats battleground Democrats, they're more prepared for this moment than the blue state Democrats. Right. You know, I could see if there is this wave coming. And, you know, we don't know. It may be Kathy Hochul wins by five, six points. Mm -hmm. That's the most likely thing that is to happen. But it is if you haven't been making a really good argument that weaves together the economy and democracy and abortion in a way that relates to voters, you like are in you know the way that I think Slotkin has done. You're in a real dangerous position. Yeah. And, and for people who say, "Oh, it just can't be done," you can't talk about preserving democracy, inflation, and crime at the same time. I would say, pull a tape of Josh Shapiro because that guy, man, mm, that, was good. that guy, Willie, we had him yesterday. He's doing he's doing everything uh, at the same time. Um, but but there there are there are issues that don't seem to be breaking Democrats' ways right now. But I just Again, you never know. And I'm not saying that to make anybody feel good. I'm telling you, in 1998, you'll remember this, yeah. every Democrat was going, Bill Clinton has let us down. And, blah, blah, blah. and people are writing op-eds going, we get what we deserve. Democrats are going to be slaughtered. And everybody was doing the post-mortem before the race. And then Republicans did extraordinarily well. I mean, our Democrats did extraordinarily well, historically. Newt Gingrich has run out of town. Holsters are wrong in 16. They were wrong in 20. The only reason I say this is, I don't want to hear everybody going the day after, oh, you, everybody got this wrong. It's tight. Mm -hmm. Every race is tight. If there's a margin of error that breaks two points, as we always have, the Republicans way, it's going to be a massive landslide for Republicans. If there's margin of error that breaks two ways in the Democrats' way, there's going to be it's going to be a huge night for Democrats. We're that close in every race, so I just don't want to hear people bitching and whining the day after the election that everybody got it wrong. Because we're saying either side could win big right now. Vegas has their money on the Republicans. <laughs> yeah. That's usually smart money. Yep. Uh, and you talk to people in the field; they have their money on Republicans. But you don't know who's going to go out and vote. You just don't know yet. No, you don't know. And I will say to your point about Josh Shapiro, he was on our show yesterday, as you said. And I think so much attention has been paid to Fetterman and Oz, and rightly so in that race. People haven't really seen a lot of Josh Shapiro. And I heard from a lot of people, you probably both did too, said, wow, he's impressive. He did exactly what Jen said, weaving abortion, democracy, the economy in, which with what looks like to be a winning message. But you're right. It's going to be different state by state. What works in Pennsylvania may not work in Georgia. Uh, the money is on the House. Jen knows this. Privately, Democrats say the House is gone. Maybe they won't say it on TV all the time. It's just a question of the margin. Right. But they're holding out hopes that Fetterman and Warnock and others can hold on. Mark Kelly and keep at least the Senate so Republicans can't run roughshod through the through the Congress. Well, we talk we talk about Josh Shapiro. He is what Pat Buchanan would call a great political athlete. Right. You look at Democrats, they have some real, I mean, Republicans have horrible candidates that because of Donald Trump, they'd be five, 10 points ahead, but for Donald Trump. Uh, but, but Democrats have a couple of people like Kathy Hochul, she's never run. 
statewide before at this level mm -hmm. as governor. And so she's not going she's not going to you know, be able to respond most likely as effectively on the trail. Uh, you look at Katie Hobbs out in Arizona, it's still one of the most confounding things to me yeah. that she ceded the entire state uh, to Carrie Lake. She has ceded the entire state to Carrie Lake. Say, your state, I'm afraid of the microphone, I'm afraid of lights, I'm afraid to hear my own voice, I'm afraid to talk to reporters. You're kind of wondering if Arizona voters might say, we're afraid for her to be our governor. In the end, the quality of the candidate matters. It does. And by the way, Oprah got uh, uh, supported John Fetterman in Pennsylvania. Oh, uh, we just heard that over the past 24 hours here. And by the way, we do have an update on the condition of Paul Pelosi. He has been released from the hospital nearly a week after a brutal assault inside the couple's San Francisco home that you heard Hillary Clinton referring to. 82-year-old Pelosi is recovering from surgery to repair a skull <clears throat> fracture after he was hit over the head with a hammer by a man who invaded <clears throat> their home. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi released a statement yesterday reading in part this, Paul is grateful to the 911 operator, emergency responders, trauma care team, ICU staff, and the entire hospital medical staff for their excellent and compassionate life-saving treatment he received after the violent assault in our home. She added that her husband remains under doctor's care as he continues to progress, progress on a long recovery. Lawyers for the accused attacker, 42-year-old uh, David DePap, will be back in court today for a preliminary hearing. He faces a series of state and federal charges stemming from the attack. And Joe, back to what Hillary Clinton said. The fact that Republicans and many of them leaders in the party, not just Donald Trump Jr., but senators, members of Congress and other Republican leaders were joking about this right. and spreading conspiracy theories. I'm still sickened by it. I, I'm our our politics are are truly broken. Well, the, the, the Republican Party is truly broken. It is. Let's just say what it in is. In pieces. They, they, they talk about uh, they're against crime and they're for the cops, unless, of course, it's the Speaker of the House's husband who was hit over the head. And then they the governor spread, makes a punchline out then, of it. Then they spread lies. Uh, they, they make political punchlines out of it. Uh, the most powerful people in the world spread the most bizarre conspiracy theories about this poor man, 82-year-old man. I mean, come on, let's just talk about I mean, I'm just going to be really blunt. We all have parents. Uh, if you've got parents in their 80s and they fall, and they just fall, that's an emergency. And that's something that you're, you, you as, a, as a, a child are dealing with for the rest of your life. This guy, I say, is a child taking care of your parents. Yeah, he's and in you're great shape. And you're worried about it. Here's a guy who's in great shape, but he's 82 years old. He got brutally attacked. He got hit in the head. He, he had emergency surgery because of a fractured skull. And Republicans and the most powerful people in, in, in the world are making fun of this guy and spreading lies. This is... It's not our politics are broken. Let's stop saying our politics are broken. Well, the Republican Party is broken. Yes, but the MAGA right is broken. There is a sickness here. And, you know, I, yeah, Mitch McConnell spoke out about it, but uh, not many others spoke out about it, uh, Adrian. And, and you look at the clip of Nancy Pelosi after Steve Scalise. Yep. I got to say this. Cover the kids' ears. I'm so sick and tired of this bullshit about, oh, but what about Steve Scalise? Nancy Pelosi was practically in tears after Steve Scalise was shot. And she said, we're all one family. There is no humanity in the Republican Party. No humanity at all. And this has proven it. Where, where are these people? Yeah. They're mocking who are, who Paul Pelosi. Them? By the way, the same people who in prime time mocked police officers who wept. Yep. Yeah about January the 6th. They want to support the blue unless the blue's trying to save American democracy against their most freakish supporters. They, they want to support law enforcement unless it's the FBI who's investigating corruption at the highest level within the Republican Party. 
It's select enforcement. They only support Madisonian democracy if their side wins. They only support law enforcement if their side gets a free pass. It is a sickness in the Republican Party. It is not a sickness in American politics. Let's bring it now, Democratic candidate for U.S. Senate in Ohio, Congressman Tim Ryan. Hey, Tim. Um, yeah. Nice sweatshirt. Listen, by the way, I'm yeah, glad you dressed I got to tell you, us. this guy knows how to run. I heard beforehand he was walking out and he had on a Michigan uh, sweatshirt and his staff said, why don't you? No. So, so uh, hey, uh, Congressman, let me ask you a question. I have, uh, just straightforward. Uh, if you lose this election, will you accept the results? Oh, of course I will, but that's not what's going to happen. But uh, to your point, you got to do what you got to do. Got to yeah. keep the country together. Yeah. All right. So, um, your race, I got to say, it is so strange. I look at polls, it's close. It, it, you look at your campaign, you've run a great campaign. We, I think most people think you've run, uh, people I talk to think you've run one of the best campaigns in America this year, if not the best, along with Josh Shapiro for a Democrat. Um, of course, it's not saying a whole lot the way Democrats have been running this year, but you've run a great campaign. <laughs> um, and yet... The National Party, I just I just don't ever hear about it. It's always an afterthought. Oh, yeah, we're worried about Georgia and Pennsylvania. But I, I don't get it. Are, are some people going to be shocked on Wednesday morning? Uh, it's going to be the beauty of the win. You know, you had the National Democrats who have long have a longstanding record of uh, not having a great strategy, not making the, the investments needed uh, to ignore this race. And we win. And we're going to win because we have uh, a lot of support from organized labor that understands uh, what's going on on the ground here in Ohio. We've got donations from all 88 counties. We have 425,000 donors from across the country uh, who understand we have a real chance to win this thing. And I'm telling you on the ground, and Joe, you've, you've done this yourself, there's the polls, and then there's what you hear on the ground. You go to rural Ohio where Donald Trump would have had a sign every 50 feet. There's a J.D. Vance sign every 10 miles. Uh, we're in these counties. We have Republican crossover support. We have the building and construction trades. Their rank and file uh, folks are coming our way in droves. Like this is going to be a shocker only to those people who live in the echo chamber in Washington, D.C. Uh, Congressman, you know I'm a Michigan guy. I'll excuse the, the sweatshirt uh, <laughs> as, as long as the game turns out the right way this year. But um, uh, what what are your conversations like with the DNC, with national Democrats, um, when you point out that, look, I'm beating this guy, I could, I could use a little money, uh, and y you haven't gotten the funds and support that really would, would definitively put you over the top. What, what are those conversations like? I haven't had one of these conversations in the, the last few months. Like, I'm not going to sit here and beg somebody to to be able to see what's happening here on the ground. I'm just not going to do it. We have our supporters. Like I said, organized labor has been huge here. We've got our low dollar uh, donors and anybody that wants to come and chip in, timforoh.com, if they want to be a part of shock in the world. Like, we have our team. We show up in Portsmouth, Ohio on a Tuesday at noon, and, and there are 60, 70, 80 people there. If, if you'd have done that five or ten years ago in Portsmouth, Ohio, right down along the Ohio River, you could have, you could have had the meeting in a phone booth. And we are, we are bringing back the old school Democrats who like the fact that I'm focused on the economic issues, that, that we're not focused on the culture wars, that we're talking about manufacturing and building things again and trade and, and the economic instability in these regions, that we want to reinvest back into those communities. And we've been doing it for 18 months. These people, I, look at my, our dog, our family dog has been in Lima, Ohio more times than J.D. Vance has. Okay? <laughs> That's how hard we've been campaigning kind of over the last 18 months. It's, you know, it's our oldest son's uh, German Shepherd. Aww. And he's honest to, uh, honest to God, this is like he's been in Lima, Ohio more than J.D. Vance. Okay. Dog's that's, name? That's probably bad when you're running for the United States Senate. Zoe. Um, Zoe. <laughs> okay. So, Congressman, uh, I won't make you answer this, but I'll just point out the state of the Vance campaign. He accused you on Fox, this is a quote last night of the following. 
that you're planning on flooding America with illegal <laughs> aliens, then using American tax dollars to fund gender reassignment surgeries oh, what an idiot. Oh, for those really aliens. Say that? yeah, that's a quote. How stupid does he think people are? As many people have pointed out, that's almost a direct ripoff from a parody that was on Succession when they were mocking that kind of rhetoric. But we'll put that to the side. You did go in this week, Congressman, into a town hall on Fox News. Um, you talked about the economy, but you also talked about the state of the democracy. You got some booze for some of the things you said, but you stood your ground and, and said you can watch the tape. We know what happened on that day as cops were beaten up. Um, let's talk about some of those voters you went on Fox News to speak to, some of those Republicans who may have voted for Donald Trump twice, but don't want to go along for the ride with J.D. Vance any further here. Do you think you can capture a bunch of them? Yeah, no, no doubt. Needless to say, we had a lot of people telling us, don't go do the Fox News town hall. You shouldn't go there. It's not going to be on the level, which, of course, we knew that. But it was an opportunity. And I'm, I'm, I'm half Irish, too, Willie. So there's the old Irish saying, is this a private fight or can anyone get into it? Uh, so so we, were, we were down with going in there. And the reality is you have that group of people that, that you know, they're election deniers, um, they're continuing to boo at people who say January 6th really happened. All, all of the insanity, the book banning, the national abortion ban, like that segment. But there are a lot of good people who may have voted for Trump for other reasons, but aren't into all that other stuff. And I want to make sure that we get a chance uh, for them to, they, they get a chance to hear my message. I am not trying to uh, further bring more hate into this uh, country, more anger, more fear. We need more love. We need more compassion. We need more concern for each other. And those people are looking for a place to go. And y your previous segment where you were talking about the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, look, I have tremendous support from workers, but there's no way you can't work with the business community. You can be hostile to greed. You can be hostile to a concentration of wealth, right? You can be hostile to income inequality. You can't be hostile to business. How are we going to develop the technologies to reverse climate change? How are we going to build the industries of the future if we're not working with the business community? And I want those people to know that. Maybe we agree five out of ten times, but my door is going to be open whether you vote for me or not. And you have to go there. And we've got more uh, commentary about just having the guts to go into that place, you know, going into the lion's den, you score points with people because you got guts and you stand your ground. So it was a character test more than it was about any particular issue. And we came out of there, you know, pretty strong in J.D. Vance. I mean, the questions they were asking him, they were like, J.D., we've got a tough one for you. How do you spell J.D.? <laughs> and that was like, it was like, oh, my God, I'm watching him go. It's like, it's insane. So, uh, Congressman, it's Jen Paul Mary. Good to see you. I think I'm coming out to Hi, see you on Monday. Uh, if you win, this means Republicans are voting for you. And, um, you know, I was out there a couple weeks ago with you and I saw, you know, I talked to some Republicans who are going to do that. Is it about, I mean, is it, is it a gut level thing with them that like this guy is Ohio, this guy is for me, or are there issues that they feel like the Republicans are not answering? But what is it that people say when they you know, Republicans say that they're gonna they're willing to support you? What's it about? I, they're they're good people, you know. They're good people, and and they watch J.D. Vance, and he's running around with Marjorie Taylor Greene. He brought in Ted Cruz. He brought in Lindsey Graham. You know, he's running around with Donald Trump Jr. And we know what Donald Trump Jr. was posting after Mr. Pelosi had that tragedy happen to him. And and I think average Ohioans who may be a moderate Republican are looking at this guy and, and they're saying, no way, no way are you going to spend the next six years in the United States Senate representing Ohio running around with Donald Trump Jr., who, who has zero class, zero grace, right, zero compassion, right? torch in the joint, and, and they're just not going to do it. And I'm telling you, like, it could be a moderate Republican in suburban Columbus who's also concerned about choice and gun safety and the environment and these other things, but it's also, you know, it's also working class uh, folks down the Ohio River. Who, who may have voted for Trump a couple times, may be Republican. They're not into the whole culture war thing. They like me, and they're like, this, this guy's not our people. He's not Ohio. We need an ass kicker, not an ass kisser. And they know the whole thing with Donald Trump. And those people watched what happened to him in Youngstown when Trump emasculated the guy. Uh, you know, on the stage in Youngstown, and, and J.D. Vance, God, 10 minutes later, he gets back up on the stage, goes right to the microphone and says, 
aren't we having a great time here tonight? Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, yeah, that's no, not Ohio. Know, Mike is Republican Senator Ron Johnson of Wisconsin appears to be already casting doubt on the legitimacy of next week's midterm election in his state. His election, it comes after a top elections official in Milwaukee was fired this week amid allegations she fraudulently requested military ballots and sent them to a Republican lawmaker known for amplifying false claims about the 2020 election. Johnson brought up those allegations yesterday when asked whether he would accept the results of Tuesday's vote. Take a look. Do you commit to accepting the results of Tuesday's election? I sure hope I can, but I can't predict what the Democrats might have planned. It sure seems like there's an awful lot of, uh, in the past, a lot of attempt on the part of Democrats to make it easier to cheat. We want to make it easy to vote, but very hard to cheat. Is that essentially, it depends on what you see? It has to. I mean, let's see, let's see how this plays out. I, I'm pretty shocked that a Democrat election official was sending out military ballots, you know, fraudulently. That's a little shocking. So here we are. Mike Barnacle, uh, welcome to the table. Uh, so here we are. Uh, it, I think we just have to, you know, our hair can't be on fire. We just have to identify people for what they are. Ron Johnson is anti-democratic. Ron Johnson, will, he's an illiberal uh, and, and just like Orban, right? He'll accept elections if he wins those elections. He won't accept elections if the people vote against him. So listen again. No need to scream and yell. Let's just put Ron Johnson down. Let's just write it down. Uh, he doesn't have faith in American democracy. He will undermine Madisonian democracy if it gets in his way of accumulating more power. This is all black and white, so we need to start. We need to just keep that list on hand and understand Ron Johnson considers American democracy considers Madisonian democracy, considers a constitution of the United States an irritant that gets in his path to power if he doesn't win. And consider the cultural difficulty involved in this, because this is like a contagion. Ron Johnson is not going to accept the results of the election, right? So there's no need for some kids in Waukesha, Wisconsin, to accept the results of the soccer match this right. weekend. Or with the league baseball. You lost? Yeah, but they cheated. They right. cheated. We win. I'm, uh, it, it's out there. There's a contagion yeah. of virus so Joe Biden and infection to... in the political system that begins at the top. It will definitely circulate right down to the lives of ordinary people it, every day. It also has to be said that it bends the mind to listen to a United States it's senator painful. who participated in the attempted coup against the government in 2020, trying to grab the high ground on election integrity. He's the one who's going to be watching out for the vote. And if it doesn't go his way, well, they cheated. He's already laid down that marker and to Mike's point every time they come out and say that you can feel it eroding things yeah. Like yeah. just a little bit more when you say it again and again and again it starts to seep into people's minds yeah and it it seeds the ground for if I lose it was because the other side cheated and Jonathan Swan we 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 have Republican candidates all across you know I love the what about ism well what about there's no what about ism here like, listen, people still bring up Hillary Clinton. They go, oh, Hillary Clinton, uh, she didn't accept it. Yes, she did. Yeah, she Hillary, conceded. I remember. Hillary Clinton conceded, like, the morning after. It wasn't well, easy for her, so, but she so conceded. I but there is no whataboutism <laughs> here. You have an entire party from Wisconsin to Arizona saying, we're not going to accept the results if we don't win. I remember um, very vividly the summer of 2020 interviewing Donald Trump. And I said to him on camera, um, you have not committed to accepting the results of the election. What does that look like? And the first thing out of his mouth, he says, well, Hillary Clinton. Has and I said, I, I, said, I, said, I said, she conceded on election night. What are you going on about? <laughs> and they said, oh, well, you know, she complained about Russia. OK, she complained about it. She conceded on election night. And so, you know, <laughs> what's different is this time around like I, I broke a story this morning which has lots of new internal emails that we've obtained between Trump lawyers between the dates of December 30 2020 and January the 7th and even on the night of January 6th when the Capitol had been ransacked 
the, the police are trying to secure the Capitol. Congress is trying to uh, get back and vote. Trump himself was on the phone to his key lawyer, Cleta Mitchell, talking about the Georgia lawsuits that they were uh, trying to pursue to overturn the election in Georgia. So they're committed to this. Um, it failed in 2020, um, really because they were caught flat-footed and, and sort of ended up being a debacle of incompetence. But what's happened since then is resources, effort, energy, intensity and planning has gone into this. That's right. And, and, and now it, it, they're dead serious about it and they're organised. And they're training. Cleta Mitchell, the person I just mentioned on these emails, she spent the past 18 months training Republican conservative activists to be election monitors. They're going to be uh, at you know polling stations and various other places in the midterm. So this is this is ongoing, but it's it's intensifying. Right. It's and intensifying. By, yeah. And by the way, wow. the documents are out there. They're all out there. The texts are out there. I, we, the, it, it 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 was a conspiracy, uh, a conspiracy that that's very well documented. They were trying to steal an American presidential election, and were figuring out, asking each, each other, how do we steal this election? How, how do we? And it, it, everybody uh, around Trump uh, tried to stop him from doing it. So he went outside, tried to steal the election, and they've been using the last two years uh, to, to to do it more effectively in 2024. When Donald Trump loses again, if he runs, because that's what Donald Trump does, he loses. He really does. I mean. The stakes were, oh, no, the stake, no, he went bust with the stakes. He went, bust, everything, everything's <laughs> gone stakes bust. Stakes weren't his. Everything's gone bankrupt with Donald Trump. He lost the popular vote both times. Uh, he, he squeaked in. He, he won one time, but he lost the House. He lost the Senate. Uh, he lost the presidency in 2020. He's going to lose again. And he knows, he knows that he's just a loser. He loses all the time. So if you're a loser... And you just don't know how to win elections, and you're Donald Trump. Then you try to figure out how to steal elections, and then you find people that have rocks in their head that happen to be senators from Wisconsin who will do the same thing, who will parrot you, uh, and you get Barack Obama supporters from Arizona uh, who uh, were on TV for a very long time, but who are so desperate, so desperate to stay in the spotlight, they'll do it too, and so it's spreading. Uh, across the country. And again, no need to pull our, our hair out. We need to write it down. We need to understand what they're doing. And we, we being people who actually love this country and respect Madisonian democracy and wake up every morning and thank God that we're a part of the American experiment, we, Republicans, independents, and Democrats, who love this country more than we love our political parties, we have to push back against it. And we will. Let's for joining us now, associate editor of the Washington Post, Bob Woodward. He's out with a new audio book entitled The Trump Tapes, Bob Woodward's 20 Interviews with President Donald Trump. And it's good to have you back. Thank well, you. Yeah. Should we let's get right to a montage of uh, that your team actually put together, Bob. Thank you. It's an interview that you conducted with then President Trump in March uh, 19th, 2020, eight days after COVID was declared a pandemic by the World Health Organization and six days after Trump declared a national emergency. This has never been heard before publicly. Let's listen. Was there a moment in all of this last two months where you said to yourself, ah, this is the leadership test of a lifetime? No. Part of it is the mystery. Part of it's the viciousness. You know, when it attacks, it attacks the lungs. Yes. And I don't know what people... I wanted to always play it down. I still like playing it down because I don't want to create a panic. Just no, panic. I don't take responsibility for this. I have nothing to do with this. Yeah. Well, I take responsibility... was no fault of mine, and it was no fault of anybody. This happened, except yeah, maybe China. China, it was China. Fauci, if you ever sat down alone with him and mm -hmm. gotten yes, a tutorial... Yes, I guess, but honestly, there's not a lot of time for that, Bob. This is right. a busy White House. This is a busy White We're House. getting very good marks from the governors. We're helping the governors, because, you know, it's a local problem. You can't solve that federally, but we're helping the government. I wanted to capture the moment when your son Barron asked you about this. 
Well, he's just turning 14, so he was 13 when he did. In the White House upstairs in his bedroom. And I said, it came out of China, Baron, pure and simple. It came out of China, and it should have been stopped. And to be honest with you, Baron, they should have let it be known it was a problem two months earlier, and the world wouldn't have a problem. We could have stopped it easily. Uh, uh, Bob, there are just so many things to, to talk about there. First of all, he's criticizing China for not letting us know two months earlier. And yet when he knew, when he had all the information, he said it was one person coming out of China and it was taken care of. And then a month later, he said it was 13 people and it was going to go away. It's just shocking. There's so many shocking things. You've got your arms around all of this now. You have so many tapes. I know you've been studying it. Where, where are you right now? Well, well see, here, here's what happened. This is March 19th. So they closed down the country six days earlier. And I'm saying, oh, you know, he's laying all this out to Barron. And as you know in reporting, things happen in chronological order, but you don't learn about them in chronological order. You go back, and I went on a six-week reporting spree after this conversation and talked to Robert O'Brien and Matt Pottinger, the national security advisors. And by the way, Pottinger was worrying about it at the end of 2019. Yes. But and so I'm in the White House asking them and they said, oh, on January 28th, we went and gave the kind of stark warning to Trump about the virus. O'Brien saying, and he has confirmed this publicly, saying, I told the president this will be the biggest national security <coughs> threat to your presidents. And Pottinger, who'd been in China seven years as a Wall Street Journal reporter, late, I, I, you know, sometimes I get shocked. I was so stunned that two months before he's telling Barron, oh, the Chinese could have stopped it. Trump could have Trump stopped knew. it by telling the truth, and by this, coming this was, out. This was even wow. well before he was saying it was only one person coming in from China. Yeah, and, and so you put this together. And so after the May 1st conversation with Pottinger and O'Brien, I went because I, I have, have time for two months going back to them, calling Pottinger at home uh, through White House signals and saying, hey, wait a minute, what's getting all the details about this? I mean, it, it, and my wife Elsa listened to all of this for about the third time and said it's a crime. Mm. And it is a crime. It is a constitutional crime. The president of the United States takes a solemn oath to execute the office of the president faithfully. Is this faithful execution? He lied to his son, he lied to me, he lied to the public. Bob, really? let's listen to some of your I'm interviews. Sorry. On the, no, no, yeah. on this very point, <laughs> we, want to, we want to support what you're telling us right now, part of your interviews with O'Brien and Pottinger. Let's listen. Okay, I think the exact phrase I used was, this will be the biggest national security threat you face in your presidency. I was pretty passionate about it. So people in China who I, I reached out to and to just get an unvarnished informal take on what was going on. And what I was hearing from them was, uh, this isn't SARS 2003, this is 1918 again. I'm talking about guys on the ground saying, here's what the real data says. They said 50%, uh, as many as 50% of the cases are asymptomatic spread, and therefore it's going to be impossible to screen for it. It's going to take off like wildfire. So that's Matthew oh Pottinger, the God. Deputy National Security Advisor, saying this is 1918. He knew. He knew how bad it was going to be, and he communicated it to the president, as you said. It struck me, Bob, listening to the first response in the Trump, where you said, did you look at this as a leadership test of a lifetime? He quickly says no to many people. Even look at it to his own benefit. He could have been this right. leader. He could, in this natural moment of crisis, he could have still said, well, it's not our fault. It's China's fault. But here's what we're going to do to get through it, and refuse time and again to a do that. A plan. And in the summer, I asked, I, again, this is so com complicated. I said, what's the plan? This is July 21st. And he said, well, um, I'll have one in 104 days. And I said, 
104, that's when the election, this was all about the election. He concealed, he denied, and he covered up. See, this is the first, uh, I'm sorry, it was this week when I called you. Mm -hmm. And I said, I finally see, this is the cover up. 1.1 million people died. Go play uh, a week after Pottinger and O'Brien give this warning. Uh, Donald Trump's State of the Union address said, oh, we've got this little problem in China and it's going to go away. Talking to 40 million people and he'd learned that the calamity, the firestorm, the wildfire was coming and I'm, try I'm trying to figure out why. Why so, would he do this? Well, again, he was downplaying it for, for political reasons and again, he'd been told this is 1918. Mm -hmm. So in the second second yes, last I'm interview sorry. with Trump, July 21st, 2020, Trump still wasn't taking any responsibility for the response to coronavirus. Let's take a listen. Hey, look, if, I did, if we didn't have the virus, I was, I was 10, 12 points up. I was cruising to election. Yeah. Well, people are worried about the virus. And I I'm know that, Bob, but the virus had nothing to do with me. It's not my problem. No, it does. China because the damn virus it's, it's, it was China. It's not me. Okay, I know, but you have the problem. And I know you've talked to Lindsay and lots of people about this. And the question is, what's the plan? How are you going to lead? Mm. And, Bob, I mean, the audio tape here is... It crystallizes what we heard from him all year long, downplaying it. The, the, we're rounding the corner. He wouldn't wear a mask. He wouldn't endorse basic public health exactly. measures because he, he was so fearful that he would lose because the virus was crashing the economy, which he thought he was basing his reelection uh, upon. And we're, as you spoke to him here and as you've gone back and reviewed it, it felt like there's panic in his voice, that he knows he has no solution. His whole political career, he's been able to get her out of trouble. He's been able to, to wish away things. And this time, wouldn't happen. Yes, but see, we didn't know for a long time about the 28th warning. And you, you, I mean, when we say when Pottinger's telling him it's 1918 Spanish flu pandemic, you know how many people, and he told Trump, 650,000 people died. Well, now we're at almost twice that. Yeah. This is, uh, you know, I, I would love to take all of this and put it together and take it to Mitch McConnell and say, listen to this. This is your president. And is this the faithful execution of the office of the president? I mean, it is beyond belief. I'm sorry to be so exercised about it, no. but you know, you put these things together. We all try to. And when it is a cold case, a cold case, he got the warning and for month after month, denial, denial, cover up. And, and